do you think there is a greater burden today on not just directors, but more specifically independent directors to be out, to be out there? Uh, and by that, I mean, you know, f f uh, as part of the work we do around um, evaluations of voting behavior and specifically the election of directors, I've, I've always said that election of directors is unique because it's really a perception vote. You know, when shareholders vote on say on pay or shareholder proposals or an equity plan, you know, it's pretty clear what they're voting on. But with directors, um, you know, no one's in the room. Uh, no one knows uh, who's asking the challenging questions and what are all these additional efforts going forth and perhaps which directors are, are not as well prepared as uh, they should be. And, um, and, and, and there was a time where if a stock was performing well, then, then there was a perception that the board was doing their job, but but those days I think are long gone, and and to your comment around the leadership, but I think it perhaps also applies more broadly to individual directors around how how do they shape the perception, either through engagements with shareholders, through disclosure and the proxy, other means, to to demonstrate to shareholders that that the independent directors are really fulfilling their duties and and representing shareholders the way they ought to be. Uh, well, okay, so you, you mentioned the disclosure and the proxy. So I, I, I think you know, the leading practice for companies is to say a lot more now about the directors. <laughs> you don't have to look very far back to find proxy statements where literally all they said about the directors was you know, their age and their occupation you know, and, right. and, and, and any other direct, public company directorships, end of story. So now they're including photos of, of the directors. You can see what they look like. They're including a biographical description that is more expansive and a statement as to why the person makes sense you know, to be on the board of directors. What, what do they bring to it? And I think that uh, all companies that I know are you know, very open about having direct engagement between investors and, and directors. It, it, it poses a practical problem. Uh, let's face it, that investors just don't have the bandwidth to start, in, in, you know, meeting with individual directors uh, extensively. So it occurs from time to time, uh, on demand, usually at the request of of the investor, but the company offers. And uh, I don't, I don't think this is so much a, you know, a big deal worth worrying about because what investors are able to assess is the uh, in terms of perception of the, the board, they can assess the performance of the company. And you know, as, if there's not a problem, then they are less likely to even go to the next question, right? And, and if there is a problem, then they can look at the policies that the company is employing that are a function of the board. So compensation policies, ESG uh, policies, strategies, big you know, transactions that the board will have approved, either financing transactions or m a transactions or whatever and then you know they can address personal issues so tenure age the you know overboarding issues that we've spoken about conflicts of interest or maybe even perceived you know conflicts of interest where the ceo might appear to be too cozy with uh, the uh, director or directors might appear to have relationships you know with each other that might taint their independence so you know, they can look at all of those kinds of things and then reach a conclusion about the perspectives, the diversity, the experience, and the decisions that the board has reached in order to form their perception about, you know, about the board as a whole. It's pretty hard to you know, form perceptions about individual directors without actually meeting with them or without developing an opinion based on something they've done outside of that particular board. 